Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with a like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Well, we will get started on today's episode where I'm excited to continue on the conversation from our last episode with the amazing Sonia Bevan. If you've missed part one of this conversation, then we'll link to it in the show notes on the ATA website so you can easily locate it there or you can simply scroll back and find it within whatever podcast app you're using. Additionally, of course, please feel free to just continue listening to this episode, which will provide a ton of value without needing to go back and listen to that earlier recording. To get started today, I'll just quickly recap with Sonia's bio and then we'll dive in. Sonia Bevan is an avid dog lover with a Bachelor of Science degree in th- physiotherapy. <laughs> this combination led to seeking science-based information on how to teach dogs and she completed a Diploma of Canine Behaviour Science and Technology with distinction through the Companion Animals Science Institute. Sonia works as a behaviour consultant in her business Dog Charming. She has been a university facilitator for vet students in animal behaviour for the past five years and her special interests are fearful and reactive dogs, low stress handling slash cooperative care, assistance dogs, she's a mind dog trainer for psychological support dogs, ethics and animal training, separation anxiety, she's also a certified separation anxiety trainer and providing freely available video training tutorials. She believes that dog and animal training is both a science and an art when based on solid principles of applied behavior analysis, teaching also allows creativity when applied to each unique learner. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome back to the show today, Sonia Bevan. Sonia, thanks again for taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. And thank you. Thank you for having me back for a second time. Oh, we'll have you back for a third or fourth time. But okay. <laughs> let, let's dive in, uh, Sonia. Uh, as often happens these days, <laughs> my curiosity gets the better of me. And before we know it, me and my guest have been talking for an hour and we haven't even got to the topic of conversation that we plan to, <laughs> which is basically mm. what occurred last time you and I connected. Uh, and last time you shared your story with us, and we're very grateful for you doing that. So in part two, let's get into the weeds of sharing what I'm sure is going to be a conversation that resonates with so many different people in our audience who have in the past potentially been through similar experiences and slash or even might be going through similar experiences now. I can think of some people off the top of my head. In fact, I know some of the people in our Animal Training Academy membership are going to really connect with this. Now, you've obviously had lots and lots of joy, as we all have, living with various animals, but inevitably we face times that really challenge us from a care perspective, but also from a mental health perspective, where we have to process a lot of new information and stay strong throughout really trying times. One of these experiences that you bravely shared with me when we caught up a few weeks ago was about supporting and caring for a canine learner who had to, unfortunately, due to an illness, become an amputee. And upon my request, you have bravely agreed to share what you learned through that process with our podcast audience today. And for those that listen to the show regularly, you know that I'm a fan of lists. (laughs) So it would be 
honored, Sonia, if you could please share with us this story and five things that you learned about life, training, and husbandry by supporting and caring for a learner who went through the experience of becoming an amputee. Okay, yes, it would be a pleasure um, to go through that. So do you want me to start with, you know, do you want me to start from the beginning, Ryan? Start from the start. (laughs) Okay, good place to start, isn't it? (laughs) All right. So remember, you probably remember from part one, I waited 20 years for this dog um, until I was working part-time and she was my best mate. And in uh, February, I think it was 2017, while she was playing with another dog, I noticed a lump on her rear leg and and I thought she'd actually been injured. You know, it was just tiny. It just looked like a a tiny little swelling, like um, she'd been knocked too hard. Um, And I didn't think much of it except that it grew. So I um, needed to take her in to the vet to get it checked out just to be safe. And that's when we found out. uh, We we did a biopsy um, and found out it was a connective tissue sarcoma. So straight away, you know, that dreaded C word, oh, my God. Um, and you've got options, you see. I, I had – so straight then I had to make decisions on what do we do now. Um, and I really appreciate my vet, sweetie, I really appreciate my vet um, giving me the option of doing nothing and saying it's okay to do nothing. And I always remember that. And at the time, um, I didn't quite take that on board and I thought I've got to do something. Um, Nothing is not an option because I didn't want to lose this dog. So just remember that because that taught me something. Um, Now I believe that doing nothing is an option because you need to weigh out what doing something, the cost benefit of that. What what are you asking of your dog and what are the costs of uh, any intervention that you do. So nothing was an option, meaning uh, enjoy her, um, let it run its course, but knowing that the outcome will be probably uh, saying goodbye to her um, in the end. And then there was chemo, um, a certain type of chemo, four sessions, and that had over 50% effectiveness rate. I think it might have even been 70% effectiveness rate. So I looked into all that. Then there's radiotherapy that we could have had, but that was over the other side of Australia, meaning a plane flight there, and that was four weeks worth. Um, And then there was um, amputation. Um, So there are four choices I had to make. Um, And without having a crystal ball, um, it's a really hard choice. So I chose chemo. Um, because it was only four chemo sessions and it seemed to have a good success rate. You know, I think uh, 70% is better than 30%. So I chose that and I love my husbandry training. So I was prepared, you know, if I'm going to put her through this stuff, if if I've made the decision to intervene, which means a lot of vet visits and maybe a lot of new people who she was a little bit shy of and wary of um, and a lot of touching, which she didn't like, and needles and sedation. It's my responsibility to prepare her for that because she doesn't know. She was sprightly. She, she didn't look sick. She didn't act sick. It was just a tiny, tiny lump, and I am now going to intervene. So I, I felt it was my responsibility, if I'm going to put her through this, to prepare her for that. Um, and that involved just husbandry behaviours like being able to accept a needle, you know, so making a needle fun for the sedation Um, and happy vet visits. I just kept visiting the vet so that new people were fun. So I was trying to prepare her for this on top of what I'd already prepared her for in our general training. So we had our first session of chemo and brought her home and it grew back larger within two weeks. And it, it was so fast that the vet, without seeing it, naturally assumed it was swelling because um, it had, I think, quadrupled in size. And that's way too fast. Um, but when I took her back for a follow-up, she was meant to have chemo in 
two weeks after the first, I took her back um, within two weeks. And I could tell from his face when his face dropped, I knew straight away it wasn't swelling. Um, it, it was a very aggressive sarcoma. So we canned that first choice. There's no point. A chemo, if one chemo um, had got this response, like basically no effect and it was growing back so big, uh, chemo was off the table. So now I had more uh, options. And again, it was I could do nothing. Or the only other option was to amputate. And amputation doesn't cure her. Amputation is done to try and prevent the spread and metastases. Hopefully, when you've got a tumour, it hasn't already spread in the system. And if we take the leg off, hopefully we get rid of the source of the cancer and give her, you know, a chance to live, I was hoping, a few more years. Um, But there's no guarantee of that because you don't know whether it's already in the system. So nothing, to do nothing was also an option. And with nothing, I had a better idea of what's going to happen. And at the risk of being... um, giving you a little bit too much information, this tumour would just keep growing until it outgrew its blood supply. And when um, tissues get too big for the blood supply, then they end up dying and that's called necrosis. And tissue that dies, think of gangrene, it goes black, it breaks down, you may get an open wound, Um, you're going to have to do a lot of care. probably dressing it. Um, It was on the inside of her leg. It may affect movement. It may start getting painful. So I I had a a fairly good idea without going through it, what it was going to look like. And the end would be that I would probably have to euthanize her um, due to the complications of this necrotic tumor breaking down and, and her pain. So I knew what to expect. So amputation, it was more I needed that crystal ball again. What do I do? Um, It was an agonising choice. Um, And it's not as easy as going, yep, just take the leg off, dogs will do fine, which is um, some of the uh, advice I had been given. My vet, again, was great, and she cautioned me that it's a big operation and big dogs, she was a Rhodesian Ridgeback, Uh, find it harder than small dogs, obviously because of their larger body weight. So I had to take into account a lot of things. I had a large dog. She wasn't really active. She was a beautiful couch potato. She was so easy to live with. Um, And I remember Kathy Sadeo talking about dogs that are not easy to motivate. So she was easy to live with because she was quite happy to just lay around and be with me. She was a little bit more challenging to train because um, she wasn't highly motivated. And if you compare that to like a terrier who, if you drop a bit of kibble underneath the couch, two weeks later, your terrier is still going to that couch every day trying to get that bit of kibble. Zuri, on the other hand, if a bit of kibble dropped about mm, five centimetres under the couch, you'd have a sniff, pour it once or twice and then go, eh, no, I didn't want it anyway. Um, and it could stay there for years, okay? Um, so it made her very easy to live with, um, but also it's something I needed to take into account in that when she lost a leg and things became difficult, um, how would she cope? Because um, Kelpies with legs cut off, and I'm just using generic, you know, breeds, you know, they run all the time. They love running. So when a leg comes off, they still like running because, they, they you know, it's very reinforcing for them. Okay, Zuri, uh, maybe that might not be the case. So, and I had to remember it's not a cure. What I'm doing if I choose amputation, I'm buying time, hopefully, 
to prevent metastases. And metastases means it spreads and it may go anywhere in the body. Usually it is the lungs, um, it can be the other organs, you know, the liver, uh, it can be in the abdomen. So I'm hopefully buying time and giving, we're aiming for quality of life. So we don't want to leave the leg because we know what's going to happen. It's going to get painful and we're going to have to say goodbye and it, it won't be very pretty. So hopefully taking the leg off will buy us this time. And I remember I, I got, it was a hard decision. I went to two surgeons because I wanted to find out about the surgery. Um, so I found out, you know, how they did it. Again, I wanted to hear what two different vets had to say. Um, and because I'm a physio, I knew there were options of prosthetics and, you know, a, a false limb. So kind of think of human amputees with your uh, leg. Um, your prosthetic leg. So they do this for animals as well. Um, and I thought that would be good because, and again, this is my physio background that was shaping my thought processes and reasoning. Um, uh, when you get a leg taken off, it changes the way you stand. So for people and for animals. So straight away, if you take one leg off, your dog is going to be standing differently um, in their base of support uh, to to take that weight. Um, and uh, I actually, there were so many things and I've actually got it written down here, so bear with me. Um, I made the choice because I wanted to protect the remaining three legs from injury, whether it's ligament and de degenerative. So think accelerating arthritis due to increased wear and tear. So if you take one leg away, the rest of the legs are going to be taking more weight, more stress, more trauma. And um, often arth um, osteoarthritis is the wearing away of the cartilage. And so that may happen sooner to the legs that are left. So that was uh, something I took into account. And just for interest, there, there, is, there have been studies done on the weight bearing of amputees. I think it was Cole and Willis in 2017 um, did a study. So four-legged dogs take 30% of the weight through each forelimb, okay, and tw about 20% through each hind limb. All right. So Zuri's was a hind limb amputee. So with um, with a four limb amputation, so you've only got one front leg left and two back legs, they found that the remaining front leg ended up taking about 47.5% of the weight and each hind limb takes about just over 26% of the weight. So you can see the front leg has was taking 30% and all of a sudden it goes up to almost 50% um, when it's a dog with a front leg being taken off. You know, in Zuri's case, a dog with a hind limb amputation, they tend to take 28% of their weight on the remaining hind limb. So before that, each leg took 20%. When you take one off, the remaining leg takes 28%. But the front legs, one of them will take about 40% of the weight and the other front limb will take 32%. So it's they're not even equal. So you'll find one front leg is taking more. So the, the you can see that the front legs and the back leg are all taking more weight. And the remaining rear leg changes position to keep balance just like a tripod. So if you think you've got four legs, it's like a square or a rectangle. When you take away one of the back legs, the remaining back leg goes inwards a bit more like a tripod to to keep balance. And this changes the way all the joints in that leg move and sit at rest. And changing the position it puts added stresses on the joints. And it's not just those joints. It's not just your ankle, knee and hip joint. It also rotates and side flexes the spine. Okay. So that compensatory movement can cause dysfunction in other parts of the body, not just back pain. So think headache, neck pain, referred pain, all right? Just like with people with um, um, amp human amputees, okay? So all these changes, they can have other consequences. So it's not as simple as going, take a leg off, dogs do fine. They might do fine because dogs are resilient, but my physio background let me know dogs often suffer in silence. So it's a huge decision to take a leg off because, yeah, your dog might get some quality of life and live longer, but you've got to 
look after the rest of their body and realise they might be suffering from pain in other ways. Um, and because the remaining muscles of the hip and knee are being used, it maintains um, muscle if you use a prosthetic. Um, and what I had to decide was, am I going to use a prosthetic or not before the amputation? Because if I'm not using a prosthetic, then the amputation comes off at the hip. So there's no nothing left. Okay, you might have a tiny, tiny stump. All right. But if you want a prosthetic, you need to take the amputation off below the knee. And luckily, Zuri's um, tumour was well below the knee. Otherwise, that wouldn't have been an option. If it was too high up, I wouldn't have had the choice of having a prosthetic. Okay. So what I'm thinking of is she have if she has a prosthetic, then she can take more weight through that side of her body. She won't be twisted so much. The other three legs won't be taking as much weight and hopefully um, she will be uh, avoid any other problems. Um, so they're the pros of getting a prosthetic, trying to prevent those other problems caused by losing a limb. Um, and another pro is that a below knee or elbow amputation is quicker and has less morbidity than a hip or a shoulder level, all right? But there are cons, all right? Um, and, and the actual con is that a suitably long stump below the knee or elbow needs to be left. And this is simply not possible all the time, you know, due to the reason for the amputation. So some dogs you're never going to be able to do that for due to trauma or where the tumour is. But the stump, if you've got a stump left, it needs to be protected from injury like knocks and bruises and falling over. If you keep falling on that stump, it doesn't have a paw pad anymore. You know, that feet, if you look at your dog's feet, they're protected by that lovely pad, that fatty pad. Uh, once you have a stump, it's just bone surrounded by skin usually no fatty tissue. So when your dog lands on that, um, the risk of injury is greater. So you need to protect your dog from that. Um, and it has to be checked daily for pressure areas, okay? That's a, a main cause of problem because pressure areas, they start with redness and then they can break down and become wounds. And another thing that I found out is also the surgeon's skill and knowledge of uh, below knee amputations. Um, where the suture line is. If I'm going to get a prosthetic, you don't want the suture line right underneath where the dog is going to be weight bearing into the prosthetic. That could be painful. So it needs to be um, on the sides of the stump. And how the bone is cut is really important. You don't want any sharp edges because remember, this dog is going to be weight bearing through the end of that bone. So these are all the things I learned. And like you can see, it's driven by my physiotherapy background and wanting to know what are all the factors. Um, a prosthetic, I think, is better when it's made and fitted for each individual as opposed to off-the-shelf products, which probably wouldn't be as effective. Um, and again, that comes from my background of knowing that human amputees, you know, they get casted and you get your uh, prosthetic to fit perfectly, you know, really snug. And there's a casting process that could be scary for anxious dogs who don't like being handled. And what does the casting process involve? Um, I found that out. There was a, you know, and in my preparation, um, there was a lot um, to prepare for, including, you know, how do they get it off? They, they saw it off with a drill. How scary is that for a dog? Um, and so if I was going to subject Azuri to this prosthetic, I needed to make sure that I overcome any of her anxieties with lots of training specific to the casting task. And it's not just get it cast, put it on, away you go. You need to teach the dog to be able to use it. And if the cast is not suitable, it may have to be repeated. So another cast, casting process. And same with humans, the stump changes with time. It changes shape. So six months down the track, I may need to get another cast done. Am I prepared for revisions? Okay. It needs to be checked twice a year, depending on the use due to wear and tear um, and those changes in the stump. And it's expensive. I couldn't find someone who does them in Australia. I think there are now. Um, I've been made aware now, but I had to do it through the US. So straight away, 
uh, more postage and import costs and, you know, a lot of technical cons, but it's really good to consider these because it's a stressful time in general with a sick dog. And, you know, an individual may decide it's just not worth the added stress. And my vet actually told me, do you really want to go down the prosthetic road? Because it's stressful enough having a really unwell dog um, to then have those decisions. And it was a huge decision. And I made the decision at the time of the operation. I chose my surgeon and even then I was undecided. That's how hard it was. Um, And I had, you know, friends supporting me, wonderful friends who didn't say yes or no. They just said, you've got all this knowledge. And that's what I want to tell people as well. Get all the research that you can, you know, do all the research that you can. And then, you know, whatever decision you've made, you've made it uh, to the best of your ability with the information you had to hand. Okay. Uh, So if you have any regrets later, you did the best you could with all the information you had at hand because we don't have a crystal ball. So Zuri was under anesthetic and the surgeon came out and said, well, what do you want to do? That's how close I was, you know, to the time. I knew the leg was coming off, but I just didn't know, are we going to do a prosthetic or not? And I said, right, I'm doing this because I'm hoping to get two more years out of her. Okay, that's the only reason. And I want it to be uh, the best for her we possibly can. So let's go for the prosthetic and let's be positive. Um, So that's what I did. That was how I made the decision um, to take the leg off and the added decision of getting a a prosthetic. Um, And so my physio background helped me in that regard, but also my dog training background, helping fearful dogs and also cooperative care. I love that stuff. So my commitment to Zuri and the perspective I had that all the time I spent on training was quality time with her and I love developing training plans and I get satisfaction from seeing her empowered through learning experiences. It wasn't a chore for me. So that choice wasn't a chore. It was great. I love this stuff. It's going to help her. Um, It may be stressful at times, but we can do this, Zuri. So, you know, I... If, if I thought, oh, my God, more training, this is going to be too hard, I would have made a totally different decision and that would have been the right decision because you've got to remember your bandwidth. You've got to remember what you can cope with um, as well. That's very important. And I think you mentioned that when you've got a sick dog, you need to look after yourself as well. Um, and because I love training so much, the thought of rehab was kind of like a coping mechanism for me. It was to be doing something. So, yeah, I've got this dog, we've taken off her leg, but let's go forward. I love this stuff. It gave me something to do and I took videos um, of of her progress. So, it it, it was daily something for me uh, to be doing to kind of cope, I guess. And it was grief, to cope with the grief of having a dog who's got cancer. And in the back of your mind, we don't know, you know, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Um, So, instead of falling in a heap, that was my way of coping. So do you want me to break now for, or do you want me to, to talk about after post-off straight away? I feel like the passion talking is flying and it would be rude of me yeah. to put any <laughs> obstacle in this way. <laughs> You're lovely. All right, so that's preamp then. All right. So, well, actually for preamp, the husbandry training and the preparation began as soon as I decided that this might be an option. So um, all those things, she's going to need so much interaction with the vet sedation beforehand, so getting used to needles. Um, Afterwards, she's probably going to need one of those e-cones so that she doesn't bother her leg. So getting her used to that, I don't want her to be fearful. It's already traumatic enough coming out without a leg. Um, Then you've got this cone put on. Um, Handling the stump afterwards, I need to get her used to strange people handling her leg, Um, getting her used to the vet room, counter conditioning to that, happy vet visits. Um, She's going to need a sling with three legs because she'll be groggy when she comes out. How's she going to walk all of a sudden? Um, And some dogs may not worry about having a sling put under her. Um, I kind of knew that that she would be a little off-putting having things wrapped around her. So I wanted to get her used to um, me wrapping lots of things around her. And an interesting thing is, you know, when you sit down, um, if I'm holding a sling and taking her body weight and I ask her to sit and yet I'm pulling up on the sling to support her body weight, I'm giving two conflicting signals. 
I'm asking her to sit, but I'm also restricting her a little bit by a little bit of pressure in the sling so she doesn't pop down and bang her stump on the ground. So while she had four legs, I was teaching her to sit with that pressure of the sling kind of pushing back, pushing upwards, if you can imagine what that would look like. Um, And so that you sit even though something's pulling up very, very slightly. Um, Steps. I'm going to need to get her into the car. So I bought some U-Butte steps and I love them. Um, uh, And getting her used to ramps as well. But I needed to teach her while she had four legs to use these. She didn't need them, but she would. And I didn't want it to be an added stressor coming out with three legs and then having to learn this new scary object. Um, So the steps and the ramp, I put a sign on the door, don't ring the doorbell because everyone knows, you know, your, your dog's recovering from surgery. Someone rings the doorbell or knocks and your dog goes running to the door, the chances of her falling over and injuring herself are greater. So everyone had to text me when they came. I put yoga mats all over the floor, got her used to this stuff beforehand so it wasn't an added shock coming out of surgery. Um, And it was all valuable stuff um, because I could see that it had helped her out of surgery. Um, And I remember after surgery, I had to get her to the vet urgently uh, because her stump had developed a little wound. Uh, one of the stitches uh, was coming, you know, had was coming through and it caused uh, a red little ulcerative area. And I couldn't lift her into the car and she couldn't jump into the car. Thank goodness I had those steps and my sling and it made it painless. And I actually, you know, I make videos, you know, I've got video of this, um, how it was just so easy for her to just go, oh, yeah, we've done this. I've got three legs now, but it's fine. Um, and now I had to prepare her. Not, we had to recover. But now then I had to repair her for the casting process. Um, and who knew there was so much involved in casting? I didn't, you know, beforehand, I didn't even realise how much. So I liaised with another physio over east and she actually sent me a video of the casting process. So I knew, not just explained it. I thought, oh, my God. I had to look at the position of the leg, had to put an under wrap, like plastic wrap around it. And I couldn't get that wrap anywhere in Australia, so I actually ordered it in. So it's like Glad Wrap, um, but it's kind of better. And you can imagine we pay about $3 um, for a roll of Glad Wrap. I think I paid $30 for a roll of this u um, Glad Wrap that stuck to itself. But it crinkled. It had a different consistency. So I got her used to it being wrapped around um, her stump over and over again. And then you've got the casting material, which is wet. Then I needed to know how. How is it put? It's put around her pelvis as well. If I hadn't seen the video, I would have thought, oh, we just do the stump. But it's put around the whole pelvis. So. I got her used to underwrap material, um, another bandage being put all around her pelvis and her leg. I wet it because the casting um, material is wet, the bandage is wet. Um, and how many people are going to be in the room? I didn't assume, so I rang up my vet and, you know, we're going to have about three people, two vet nurses and a vet crowding around her. So I needed to get her used to another person doing it, not me, and another person standing by. Um, And the position, I could have sedated her. Now, I could have chosen to bypass all this, sedate her, and we just do the casting. And again, the reason I didn't was because when she sedated, she would be lying down um, and the leg would be hanging in a different position. And I wanted this to be as successful as possible. So I wanted her to be in standing um, with the leg hanging down the way it would be in in standing. So that's why I put all this effort into getting her used to that because if I'm putting her through this, I want it to be successful. So I want to ease her stress and it must be, you know, as successful as possible. Um, And just the fact, how long is it going to take? Many minutes. And a dog without a, um, a leg, they fatigue very quickly. And we forget this, like in, in the beginning, she could only stand up for seconds initially. And remember, she was a couch potato. Um, so when it becomes too hard, she's not like a kelpie that goes, oh, I'm a bit tired, but oh, I'll get through this. She was, oh, I'm a bit tired now. I'm going to go lie down. So I had to help her stand for longer and longer and get her used to having the sling again because, you know, after a few minutes, 
they're still going to be casting. She's going to want to collapse. I need to get her used to I'm holding you up now as well as all these people standing around you and casting um, your leg and get her used to the sound of a saw because it dries and then they cut it off. And if you're not sedated, that can be really scary. Um, And I didn't have a saw to use, but I've got her used to a Dremel and I've got her used to clippers. So what I found at the time was that she generalized really well to the sound of that high-pitched saw. Um, So the fact that I didn't get her used to that sound in particular, all the training I'd done on all those other sound helps. So no training is ever wasted, guys. Nothing is ever wasted. Um, And I think that's what we call resilience as well, training them for all these tasks and then they bounce back when there's something new. So that's a whole lot of preparation, you know. And that's why I thought about it long and hard before choosing the amputation because I do love this. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was kind of fun for me, you know, um, and it, I knew it was helping her. So on the day we got the cast done, we were also lucky enough I travelled. Again, if I hadn't had someone to do the casting, the prosthetic wouldn't have been an option. So I was just fortunate enough, I believe, that there was a low-stress vet about one hour and 15 minutes away who had a purpose-built low-stress um, clinic. Um, so I talked to him on the phone, prepared, asked you know everything that was going to happen, uh, took her there. He gave her about half an hour to get used to the room. We did practice runs. Uh, He let me video it. So I do have video of it. And one day I'm going to edit that so that you can see just how amazing it was. Um, The first run we did didn't work. So we had to do a second run. So thank goodness I'd built her endurance up um, with a break in between. Um, So it went well during the day and she did amazing for a, and I don't like labeling her an anxious dog. She's just, she likes people she knows and she doesn't like being touched by people she doesn't know. So that was a huge thing for her. So all the training came to the fore. She did amazing. Um, we got a prosthetic that now we had to wait to come all the way from America and then began the rehab. So again, it was more training, um, building up that stamina. You've got to remember you only put it on for about an hour during the day and then take it off because if you put it on for eight hours, you're going to get pressure sores and it's going to be sore and, you know, your dog might not want to use it if it's uncomfortable. So get them used to it gradually. And you're going to have to teach the dog to put weight through that leg. It's going to feel different. Um, Oh, and one of the things I did there, we did have a hiccup. When she first came out of the operation, her stump was flexed, meaning it was the knee and hip were held tight to her body. You know how a dog limps and they hold a sore leg right up to their body? It was held up there probably due to pain. The vet thought it was um, a contracture. I wasn't as convinced. I thought, oh, my God, she's in pain. Um, And if that didn't rectify, if her little stump stayed tight against her body, there's no way she's going to be able to use a prosthetic because it needs to be hanging down like the other leg. So I remember getting the news straight out the operation. I, I was waiting in a cafe with friends and I just burst out crying. I thought, oh, I've put her through this. And we can't even, we're not going to be able to even prepare her for the prosthetic. But I bet, you know, I picked myself up and goes, no, I'm a physio. You know, the vet, the vet thinks it's a, a contracture. I don't think so. I don't think they occur that quickly. I think it's pain. We can get her on pain med. I can do stretches. I will prepare for this. And, you know, after a couple of weeks, it did drop back down. And I think that's because the pain uh, was subsiding and also with the rehab I was doing with her to, to stretch that out. Um, so had to teach her to put weight on that. So I had to come up with creative ideas. Um, and I've got video of this as well. And I need to do a webinar of all this stuff because I think it would be really valuable because even as I'm going through it and thinking, you know, hearing me talk about it is good. But when you actually see it, it's actually amazing. And the problem solving I had to go through was really challenging. Um, but as you can see, it kept my mind going. And instead of grieving, it, it kept my mind um, on something productive and positive. So how do you get a dog to weight bear um, of their own accord, you know, without pushing them, you know, pushing the weight over onto that side? I wanted it to be uh, think creatively and get her doing it. So I took her out on the decking and I clicker trained her that every time the prosthetic tapped on the decking, it made a sound that was an audible sound. I'd click for that sound 
and give her a treat. So I ended up getting this dog that would start stamping her prosthetic leg on the ground and then I'd get her stamping longer and longer. So that was a fun way that I got her playing a game of you know, using her prosthetic leg. And it was an audible signal for me that the le- there is weight going through that. And I could tell whether she was stomping harder or not because the sound would be louder. So I could tell the amplitude of the stomping. Um, and getting her used to it, you know, took a few weeks. And also hydrotherapy, I remember using, you know, to, to keep the other legs um, active, range of mov- movement active and getting weight bearing through that. So hydrotherapy, not with the prosthetic on. And I included hydrotherapy because another important factor um, was made clear to me. I went to a hydrotherapy pool. I thought, how great to have this opportunity. But looking at it from a dog's perspective, it had steps and it had a ramp, but the step was very large. And you and I looked at it like a dog looked at it. You couldn't see there was a step under the water. So the dog has no idea that there is a step there. And again, I'm using Kelpies a lot, aren't I? I should, I should use Labradors bounding around. Um, you know, a Labrador would just jump in. Yay, it's water. My Ridgeback, eh, not so much. She would walk in water, but on the beach, you know, where she can feel the ground, she'd walk deeper and deeper. She is not one to just jump on into the water. So I saw her looking and it looked deep. And no amount of me encouraging her, even standing there, could convince her that it wasn't. And remember, she's feeling she's not so secure now with these three legs. So she doesn't have four legs to jump in. She's got three legs to jump in. And it looks scary. She can't see the bottom. So we couldn't use the step to get in the pool, bottom line. So I thought, great, they've got a ramp. Okay, the ramp was also under the water. So she couldn't see that there was a ramp there. Um, And it was steep. So what would be nicer would be a longer ramp with a lower gradient, uh, a gradual gradient, rather than a ramp that's hidden. We know it's there, but hidden under the water and is quite steep. So a dog with three legs might slide down it, even though it did have a surface. So I couldn't convince her to use that. And because I wanted therapy to be fun, I did not want it to be scary. I didn't take their advice and just throw her in with her life jacket on. She'll get used to it and give her a treat. I went back probably about five times and she tried. I could see she was trying. She wanted to launch, but she just couldn't. So I'm lucky enough that I lived near the beach. I was lucky enough that the weather was beautiful. Um, We didn't have waves. I took her down the beach and we did our hydrotherapy there on a very calm beach. With a gradient, she would go in and I used some beautiful techniques. And I remember uh, hearing Peter Clark talk about an elephant that she helped go into a huge crate. And by giving the elephant the choice to go out and reinforcing out as well as in, they got more enthusiasm. They didn't get an elephant that was creeping into the crate. They actually got an elephant that wanted to go in, but always knew it could come out and then eventually didn't go out. So I said, right, I'm going to do that with my hydro sessions. Uh, She can have the choice. She comes in, boom, And then I make a game. I would run out the water. She'd come out with me and I'd give her a treat for coming out. She chose to go back in the water. I treat her and eventually she stayed in longer and longer. And so we got our hydrotherapy sessions in. And wouldn't you know it, we did need a revision. So she was doing really well. Oh, and I must, I mustn't forget the postie. Okay. Um, We had a postie that Zuri used to bark at. He was so lovely. He would, he he used to buy biscuits and he would give every dog he visited a biscuit. So dogs that used to bark at him ended up stopping barking at him. He didn't even know the principles he was using. And I just said, you are doing an amazing job. Zuri ended up hearing his van at the next block and getting really excited. So I would use him. The sound of him meant your prosthetic is going on and then you get to go outside. So she ended up loving having her prosthetic put on and she would use it when he was around um, because she was a bit, if she was a bit lackluster at other times, I wanted it always to be a positive experience. Um, He helped us immensely by just walking around our front yard and she would follow him. Um, So her her weight-bearing therapy uh, became um, fun for her. And that was really important. I wanted all this to be fun for her. It was so important. There's no no point giving your dog quality of life if the getting there is fraught with trauma and pain and um, and fear. 
you know, and no choice. Um, so I'm indebted to to that postie um, who helped who helped us uh, with her rehab. And how did I, I was, uh, yes, so we needed a revision um, and it got sent away and that's where the hydro came in really important and all her active exercises. And remember, I'm a physio, so I didn't have to travel to do the physio. So that was another uh, guiding factor that I could do her physio myself and I know how to progress it. It would have been harder if I had to rely on outside uh, sources to guide me what, what to do next. So we're waiting for the revision to come. So off it goes to America again. It comes back. Um, but uh, I noticed something was wrong with Zuri. We'd go down to the beach and and she was walking slower and she'd started panting a bit and she never panted. Uh, even after a run, she hardly panted. Uh, she went off her food more than normal. And I just had a gut feeling that something was wrong. So um, I prompted my vet to fast track me back to the oncologist. We got in, we took x-rays and we felt her tummy and we took it. Uh, we didn't even need to take an ultrasound. She had a huge mass in her abdomen and th- her lungs just looked like a leopard skin patchwork of metastases. So, and that let me know, wow, I did not know how sick you were. And so th- that showed me dogs soldier on. It wasn't until I noticed changes in her behaviour like panting, um, just slight panting, but I thought that's different, that let me know something was going on. And so she was she was a lot sicker than I realised. And I remember the vet, um, I was just staring at the x-ray with my hand over my mouth and the vet turned it off and said, uh, this is too depressing. Um, you've got a very sick dog. So my thing now was, right, we've reached that point. Um now it was another choice, you know. When you've got a sick dog, you just got all these choices, and and you're already distressed, but you've got to keep it together. Do I wait and have my friend stay with me for a bit longer? How long do I wait, or do I make a decision very quickly? So I asked the vet, you know, um, how long, you know, do you think she's got? And she goes, well, it could be a week, it could be a little bit more, but she's really sick. And I said, would now be too soon? She goes, no, now would not be too soon. But I could not do now. Now I could not do it right then and there. I needed I needed some time. And I said, "How about you know? Can we can we give all I want is two good days. I want um, uh, can we give her something to take away pain, to make her feel happier, to get her appetite back? I want to give her a lamb shank because she wasn't even eating her favorite things. Um, I want her to wag her tail at her favorite people." Um, yeah, I'm getting a bit teary. I'm getting teary as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and the vet said, yeah, the vet could help me with that. So I think we put her on some some steroids. And I got um, my doggy a little bit back. I got the waggy tail back. Um, she could have as much lamb shanks as she wanted without giving her diarrhea. Um, it was amazing. So that was on a Wednesday afternoon, I found out. And so two days meant it was going to be a Saturday and wouldn't you know it, Saturday was my birthday. So I had another decision to make. Oh, my God, you know, do I extend it, you know, to after my birthday? And I thought, no, nah, you know what? We we asked for two days. We will go on my birthday. And my thinking was, yeah, it's going to be hard, you know, you're going to have this sadness on your birthday. But eventually it's going to be an anniversary that you share together. You're going to remember on your birthday that you had a wonderful dog. Um and her going out, you know, needed to be stress-free as well. So on Thursday, all her favourite people, you know, I didn't, you know, her favourite people came to visit. Her postie came and sat with her for about 10 minutes. So he came after his run to sit with her because he used to come every day for our rehab. He would help us, even if we had no mail. Um, and he became a bit famous on Facebook, actually. Uh, she got her appetite back. We went, she came and had a massage with me. We went to our favourite cafe and she had her croquettes and um, on the day I thought, you know, we'll do whatever you want. We just followed around the house. So I had a friend actually, I had a wonderful friend who flew over, got a flight over from Queensland uh, to be there with her and, and Zuri loved her so that she would be there for the day. So what amazing friends that would come. She just started a new job. Um, she'd only been there four days and she told uh, her employer, look, I need to go. Um, because my friend's dog's dying and I need to be there. So, um, 
they let her go, which is wonderful. There's some wonderful people out there. Um, and so I chose to do it at home in the car, her favourite place, in the back of the car where she'd be comfortable. My vet trusted me with the sedation um, so that I could sedate her beforehand so she was not scared at all with someone cornering her in the car that 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 she didn't know very well. Um, yeah, and it was, you know, euthanasia. It was, you know, as far as euthanasias go, it was um, peaceful for her, beautiful, and, yeah, it was... Yeah, we even, I know there's one thing that I did regret is that I could see she was getting a little bit worried. She wasn't panicking as such, but even with the sedation on board, um, I could see her moving her head away when the vet came closer. So we put a towel over her head and that calmed her immediately. But what I wish was, I wish we put the towel over her head and my head so I could still see her because I was cupping her head in my hands. And she went and I didn't cry. Someone else was crying, I remember. But I just, I didn't feel her go. I was just going, oh, my God, it was so peaceful, so uh, uneventful. And I just, I think I stayed there for about half an hour with her head in my hand. Um, and then there was the grieving, wouldn't you know it? So the the grieving process, um, I couldn't go inside. So we did it outside. So we set up a little wake out the front with the car door. I couldn't shut the car door. Um, she was picked up and taken away. We, we stayed with her for about an hour. And then uh, the crematorium came and, and picked her up. And I could not go inside because there was no dog there greeting me anymore. So we stayed out there. That was in the afternoon. Twelve hours later, we were still out the front. We were going to have a little wake out the back. But my friend says, no, nope. we brought all the fairy lights, draped them around the car, put a photo there, put, and we ordered meals. And we just sat around talking about Zuri. With the car, I couldn't, I couldn't even shut the car door um, because shutting the car door was like, uh, closing. So everyone just stayed. Um, Jesus, sad, isn't it? Um, but it's beautiful as well because everyone just stayed and said, no, we're going to stay. We're getting meal brought in. And a neighbour came over and sat with us and we just sat there and just talked until it got to about 1 or 2 a.m. and finally went inside. And um, and then the grieving began, which, you know, it, we all have to go through. We love these guys so much. Um the grieving began, um, and I di- did a very thoughtful, active grieving process. <laughs> Excuse me for sniffing, um, and that is my way. And um, so, you know, I used to fill her water every morning out the front where we used to sit, and I could not not fill up her water. So I filled up her water, and I had frangipanis dropping all over the yard, so I would fill it up with frangipanis. So every morning I'd fill up her water and fill it with flowers. And I couldn't, she used to come everywhere within the car and I could not just go into my car without opening the back door. So I thought, right, I'm not going to stop. Why do I need to stop? So I would open the back door, put a frangipani in as if I was putting my dog in and go, there you go, Zuri. And I would drive off. And that happened for weeks until one day I didn't need to open the back door anymore and put a frangipani in. So I had all these dead frangipanis in the, in the back seat, but I thought, okay, but it helped me to go through all these rituals. And I did crazy stuff like I, I frocked up every day. I went and bought so many dresses from the op shops. And to get myself up in the morning, I said, let's put on something really colourful and remember Zuri. So I would put up, put on this new op shop frock, do my hair, maybe put on a bit of lippy and go, let's get through the day in remembrance of Zuri. Because uh, I really felt I had to do something active because if I didn't, I, I would fall in a heap. Um, and I miss the videos. What do you do when you make videos all the time of your dog? Um, so I made live Facebook videos of my grieving process, crazy nutty videos that are not for everyone, but just going, here I am, check out my new frock. Um, and it was for me as well to track my grieving process. You know, what does a dog trainer do when their dog's gone, when, when their heart's been ripped out? Um, and I kept – so that was instead of doing Zuri videos, I was doing – videos documenting my grieving process. Um, there's, I think it's a psychologist called Dr. Vanessa Rolf. It just so happened a, a week after Zuri died, she did a webinar on grief through the PPG. So I got up at 7am in the morning to listen to that live and that really helped. Um, so it was all about um, people uh, losing pets and grieving. I kept her daily medication alarm on. So, you know, I didn't have to give her her medication anymore, but it still went off, you know, 8.30 every morning, 8.30 every night. Um, and I would remember her 
And I've still, to this day, it's been two and a half years and it still goes off. And that's because now Willow needs medication as well. But we always think, thanks, Zuri. Thank you for reminding us to take our medication. And I was lucky enough that visiting puppies, there were a litter of Ridgeback puppies ran, um, half an hour away from me. I visited them probably five times a week. The breeder was so lovely. She saw I was grieving. I just covered myself in puppies. And instead of making me sad, it made me really happy. It was the one time I was just uh, engaging in this puppy pleasure. And then when I got in the car, the sadness would resume. So visiting other people's dogs and engrossing myself in puppies helped me. And I journaled as well. Um, That really helped. And I did, so you can see it's all active stuff. I had to do active stuff. Um, I planted lots of pink flowers and I, and I oiled the deck and the chairs that I oil, you know, that Zuri and I used to sit in and sit on. And I, you know, would sit out there watching the pink flowers as if she was with me. And then I fostered a puppy and had to give it back. And I, my preconceived idea, and this is another thing I've learned, I thought you need to grieve, you know, when there is no right way to grieve, okay, but uh, my way is that I need to mourn this dog for a suitable length of time and how, you know, that could even be forever because she could never be replaced. I cannot imagine getting another dog, but I need to give it a suitable amount of time before getting another dog. Um, I fostered this puppy. I gave her back. I realized that I needed a puppy, tried to get her back. It was too late. And I went on a frantic search for a puppy, and that's how I ended up getting Little Willow. So I had to eat humble pie because although I said everyone grieves differently, there is no right or wrong way to grieve. I kind of felt my way was a bit better. I kind of felt that if you really loved your dog, you wouldn't go get another dog to replace it so quickly. You know, that's a measure of how much you really love your dog, I reckon. And here I am, I turn around frantically, desperately needing um, to fill that void. And what I realised was it wasn't replacing Zuri at all. It was uh, a little puppy filling that empty void and helping me cope with a massive loss. Um, So, yeah, I ended up eating humble pie, only in my own mind, you know, um, I didn't even realise that I felt maybe a little bit superior in in my in my grieving process. So there you go. So that is the story of Sonia and Zuri from Woe to Go, um, Love and Loss. So what were the five things you learned? Yeah. About? <laughs> no, no, no. I I wrote them, I wrote them down. Good on uh, you. Let's see one, if they're the same as what I wrote down. Yeah. One one was to uh, and and these are in no order. By yeah. The way. Yeah. Uh, one was to think creatively, mm-hmm. which, for example, you did with the hydrotherapy. Yeah. Number two was that no training is ever wasted. Oh, big one, big one. Uh, which you yeah. learned was all of the things that could be generalized to some of the things that Zuri had to go through. Yeah. Number three was that do, doing nothing is always, always an option. Yes, yes. Number four you acknowledge that for a lot of people, this journey is going to be uh, influenced by the resources they have available. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a big consideration that you had to factor in and um, weigh up the pros and cons. Yeah. Uh, and number five is uh, own your grieving. The feelings are real and need honouring. There is no right way. Yeah. You, wow, you were listening. Is that exactly what you had written down? It's not exactly, but it's damn close. <laughs> what did you have written down? All right, have- look, I had I had communication and planning, which is, you know, to devise all the husbandry plans, which is similar to, um, you know, nothing is ever wasted. I did have no training is ever wasted, big one. I did have there is no right or wrong way to grieve. You do it in your own way. Um so that was three. I had the communication and planning and then also no training is ever wasted as two separate ones and you kind of um, combine them. Uh, I had, it's given me a great empathy for others with chronic or terminally ill pets, um, especially a measured and compassionate approach when being asked or offering advice because um, it's a fragile time and, you know, it's a mix of hope and guilt. So some of the things I came up were were people telling me what to do. I don't think I would ever tell anyone what to do or even say you've made the right decision or you've made the wrong decision. Or even, you know, um, 
I, w- I would have people telling me, oh, did you feed her a raw diet? Oh, you shouldn't do ke- chemo or chemo is poisonous, you know. Telling this to someone who has to make this decision uh, on on a dog they love so much is is rather actually unkind, I think, because, um, you know, chemo is an option. And to say that don't do that, you're poisoning your dog, and then they go and do it, well, they know what you, you know, now they've got that guilt. They've got the hope of the chemo working, but they've also got that guilt that they're poisoning their dog. Um, and I did all the right things, you know, right, right. You can see my fingers here, quotation marks, people, right. Um, you know, raw diet. I didn't over-vaccinate. I teeter tested. Um, I, I We didn't do lots of worming stuff. Um, you know, I tried not to put all these chemicals into her body and we still got cancer. Go figure. And even then I would have someone go, you know, did you feed her a raw diet? And I go, well, yeah, I did. Ah, but was it organic? Was it organically processed human grade raw? And I just thought, go away, you know. Um, So, and also the, yeah, so that empathy for people going through a hard time, I would not, I would not offer my advice to them. I would rather offer support and say things like, you know, you need to do what is right for you. It sounds like a cliche, but you need to weigh it up. And I know you will do the best for your dog with the information you have, not say, yep, right or wrong, but more just be there for them. Um, and the, the, the fifth one that I had was social media. Um, what you see on social media isn't necessarily the seamless process that you encounter in real life. I got on uh, social media groups with amputee dogs and the ones you see there, they are doing great. They're running around and you've got music on, you know, you see all these things. Yeah, it's great. And even the prosthetics, the, you know, animals love prosthetics. Well, you know, they don't, you know, they, some might adapt better, but Zuri, yeah, it took her a while to get used to it, you know, so there was. Um, and not all dogs do well with three legs, but that's what you hear. Yeah, get get the leg chopped off. They do fine. They're fine. They do fine. Um, they look like they do fine. They are so resilient, but there is a price to pay with having your leg chopped off, okay? Um, and, you know, so what you see and, and the information you get on social media, we already know it's a bad place to go for reliable information, but also even the encouraging stuff can be very discouraging for someone who gets that dog that doesn't cope well with whatever intervention every other dog is coping with. And, you know, we all talk about the study of one. It is a study of one. And you've got to remember what you see on social media. People aren't going to show you their despair and when it didn't work. So you're going to get a skewed idea of, yay, this works. Yay, look, my dog bounced back. Yay, after two weeks, my dog's running around. Um, For those who look at that and go, wow, it's been four weeks and my dog is still walking slow. Jeez, I must be one of the unlucky ones. Well, you don't know because people aren't going to post their dog walking slowly or their dog curled up in pain or having difficulty with something. So social media was was a biggie, um, yeah. Did that make sense? None was. No, Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and then potentially another one, another one, another uh, takeaway that you could contribute to the offer- offerings that you've made is, uh, and, and tell me if you don't feel that this was part of your story. Yeah. Uh, but that is to tr- trust your gut. Would you say that that factored into? Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 What is the gut? I battle with this all the time. Um, you, you you spoke about trusting your gut when you said that you noticed something was wrong with Zuri. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, in that regard, yes, yes. And look, it's your gut, but it's also your – what is your gut? It's your prior experience. It's what you know works for you. It's what, you know – so your gut is basically what feels right for you, but it is based on your past experience, I'm sure. You know, I don't think it comes out of nowhere. So yes, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's it's yeah. Maybe maybe you can think about it as your instincts. Yep. Yeah. And, yep. and say and and, and I, I I lean on it a lot when yep. it's like I'm just going to make a quick decision. You're just like ask myself and whatever the question is that that's your gut. Like yep. that is all of your experience and all of your knowledge, kind of helping you come to a decision in the present moment under those. Yeah. Um, time and pressure restraints I don't know yep yep I think yes whatever the gut is sometimes if you've got a really uncomfortable feeling go with it 
or if you've got a really strong feeling, then it is, it's coming from somewhere. So, yeah, yeah. But you, you, and you can tell with my science base, I kind of go, oh, but where is this gut feeling coming from? You know, but it's still valuable. It's, yeah. We, we use this acronym we learned when we were preparing for the birth of our daughter called Use Your Brain. Uh, the, the B stands for benefits. The R stands for risks. The A stands for alternatives. The I stands for instincts. Uh. And the N stands for do nothing. Uh. And we, we were put in a position to use our brain collectively, me, my wife, and my mother-in-law, when they were discussing with us whether we wanted to potentially have a caesarean section. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of pressure. And that was, a you know, every moment that went past was risky at that point in our journey. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's in moments like that I found where you're like, you've got to like go, what is, what, what is my gut, yeah. <laughs> my instincts um, telling me in this moment? And, and I imagine there would have been some, and, and, and maybe my imaginations are not accurate with re- regards to your story. Yeah. Um, some of this, some similarities to this playing out when your surgeon asked you, so are we going to go with the amputee mm. option or the other option? Like at that point, you've had to go, I've, I've done everything I can, I've got all the information I have, and now is the time to make that decision. Mm. And your gut said, I'm hungry. No. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what else to say but thank you? Uh, yeah. I cried. I wiped tears away from my face. Yeah. Oh, I've got one more important thing to say. You yes. can't get rid of me now. You, you, you know, it was a big decision to come on a podcast, and now you can't get rid of me. But for Didn't anyone, trust in my gut. Sorry, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but look, this is really, really. I think it's really important. Um, okay, it's all been done. I made all those decisions, and then you kind of go looking back. Did I make the right decision? You know, you, you expect it may, in retrospect, it may all become clearer. Just to let anyone out there know, I still don't know if I made the right decisions from the very beginning. I actually look back, it was quite hard for my dog. I made it as easy as possible for her. Sometimes I think, you know what, maybe I should have left your leg on and had two months of zoomies and playing because, you know, I got seven months. I might not, you know, it was growing so fast. I might have only had her for another eight weeks and then things started getting yucky. But maybe I should have had you know, eight weeks of quality, quality time um, until the pain set in, until I had to make some really hard decisions. But she had four legs and she could run still. And, you know, maybe I should have done that. Um, I don't, I still don't know, but I'm not hammering myself over it because I had no idea of knowing how this would pan out. I actually told my vet, you know, I'm only doing this because I'm, you know, I'm hoping it's going to give us a couple of years together. And my vet was hopeful that, yeah, yeah. I said, if it's only going to give us six months together, I'm not taking her leg off. So we didn't know. So there's no point hammering myself over what I didn't know. I can go, you tried your hardest. You got as much information as you could and you made the decisions based on that. You'll never know, you know, what might have been. But you did know what would happen if you didn't. You did know it would be quick and you did know it probably wouldn't be very nice. So, yeah, in re- you know, so if anyone thinks they should feel like they made the right decision, well, I don't know if I made the right decision or not, but I am reconciled with it that I did the best I could with the knowledge I had at the time. There you go. I'll shut up now. Hey, you've jumped on a podcast episode and you've uh, shared so bravely that you brought yourself to tears, mm. me, and I have no doubt some of the listeners of this show. Uh, so gratitude to that uh, and gratitude to you for that. Mm. Uh, and thank, thank you, you to Zuri. Thank you so much, Zuri, because, yeah, I mean, you know. we get to honour him like this. Yeah, her, her. Yeah, sorry. We get to yeah. honour her like this. Yeah, yeah. And she's still around. Kathy Sadeo uses her in, in her um, one of her webinars, the food as uh, eating as a – is, uh, is a reinforcer. Food is, no, um, operant. Eating is an operant behaviour. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually sent her in the last week, Zuri wouldn't eat again. Here I come coming up with more stuff. 
Um, so I actually went into training mode. She, I've actually got – so Kathy shows this video where Zuri would not eat a liver treat and then I go into asking her for an operant behaviour and click and she will then eat. So all that training just somehow clicked her back into being able to eat when she was in training mode. But, you know, so the very same object. So she's still around teaching people, you know. So she, she lives on um, in some amazing – footage so thank you Zuri so nothing was ever wasted hey we've had Dr Vanessa Rolf on the HA podcast show before ah, so yeah you can go back and find that episode uh, in our catalogue and listen to that uh, if you are in our industry and you are dealing with grief or you are facing these things we've also got episodes with Colleen Pilar and she's got a great community uh, to offer support uh, for these parts of our uh, roles as extremely caring people uh, that uh, might be beneficial for you so definitely to build on what Sonia's bravely shared with us today uh, hopefully this has created a sense of uh, you're not alone out there. Uh, there's help out there. And Sonia, Sonia if people want to reach out to you, how would they go about doing that and where can they find you? They can find um, on my website, dogcharming.com.au, and there's my contact details there and my email there. I'm on Facebook as well, Dog Charming, um, where I post a lot of things. Um, I'm on Instagram a bit, also Dog Charming. And I think that's it, isn't it? Facebook, Instagram, website. Um, my email is info at dogcharming.com.au. TikTok, Snapchat. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> hey, we will, of course, link to all of this in the show notes as well. We're going to wrap it up there, though, for today. Sonia, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you. Thank you for coming on the show with us twice. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate you too and everything that you do. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon. Bye.